Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Dennis Reardon, president of Minnetonka Audubon Society, and uh, welcome to this evening's community program. <clears throat> Our land recognition statement, Minnetonka wishes to honor the indigenous communities native to the chapter area, including the Pagusset, Wepawag, Quinnipiac, Tatakit, Minnetonka, and the Hamanasset people. As we advocate for conservation of land and its wildlife, we're indebted to the work of native and indigenous people who cherished the land for thousands of years before European colonization. Uh, I have a couple of announcements. There's an important bill in the General Assembly Environment Committee to require state buildings and state lease buildings to turn off unnecessary lighting during migration. I'll put a link in the chat to uh, an action alert. I ask you to take a look at it and write your representatives to urge them to vote the bill out of committee. And next Wednesday, March 30th, former DEEP Commissioner, Dr. Robert Klee, who is now teaching at Yale School of Environment and the Yale Law School will give us his perspective uh, on the local effects of climate change and present a case for local and state climate policy and what are the collective next steps that we can take. You can register for that program on our website. I'll put a link in the chat for that also. And before we get started, please remember to keep yourself muted during the program. If you have questions, enter them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. At the end, you can also raise your hand in the reactions button and you can unmute yourself and ask your question. And now to tonight's program. Pat Lynch is the author of many field guides, uh, most recently a field guide to the mid-Atlantic coast. His, his other guides <clears throat> cover the east and gulf coasts of America a field guide to North Atlantic wildlife, a field guide to Southeast coast in the Gulf of Mexico, a field guide to Long Island Sound, and a field guide to Cape Cod, including Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Block Island, and Eastern Long Island. So now <clears throat> with that, uh, I'd welcome Pat Lynch. Pat. Um Dennis, thanks very much. Um, let me uh, share my screen here. Get the PowerPoint up. Okay, thank you. Um, Dennis, um, you're looking at my title screen? Yep. Yes, Okay. perfect. Good, good, okay. Well, um, thanks very much for having me. I'm gonna be talking about what we've done in our yard really not so much. Um, we've been in our house about 25 years and we've always been into pollinators and wildlife and photographing butterflies and things like that. But it's really been in the last, um, uh, I would say five or six years that we've really started to try and transform the yard. And I should say up front that um, if I have any claim to uh, your time, um, it's not because I'm uh, so knowledgeable a gardener or expert, particularly on wildlife or bees. Um, uh, most author, uh, but um, uh, as I say, if we have a claim on your time, it is that uh, we've changed things about our yard in relatively modest, but in some, some ways important ways and then paid a lot of attention to what happened afterward. And a lot of this was inspired by um, things we've read in um, Doug Tallamy's books, for example. Um, people who are into pollinators and whatnot know Doug Tallamy really well. And um, uh, those have been a tremendous inspiration to us, especially his um, latest book uh, on um, 
Oh, it's called Nature's Best Hope, but his concept of uh, the sort of backyard um, or homegrown national park, that is, there are actual concrete useful things we can each do in our own yards, which can collectively have a big impact on, on wildlife. And so um, that's the sort of concept we've been working with lately. And it's, it's about... Uh, almost as much about what you don't do as what you can do in your yard, um, as I'll explain in a few minutes. The other thing I've noticed uh, personally, um, because I'm into natural history and whatnot, for example, um, uh, in the 70s, 80s, I'd drive down to go birding in Florida, Florida Keys, things like that. And if you're on I-95 in Florida, uh, back then at least, um, you had to keep Windex and paper towels in your car all the time. And every few hours or so, you'd have to stop and get the bugs off your windshield. There were so many of them, especially larger insects like dragonflies and whatnot. These days, unfortunately, I can drive, say, from Orlando over to Merritt Island and, and the east coast of Florida. I can drive around all day and um, uh, may not get any bug strikes at all. That's strange. Um, and and it's not the sort of thing that that um, uh, you necessarily notice all the time, but once you do notice, um, it can make you deeply queasy. One of my favorite places on earth to go to is uh, Merritt Island. It's the uh, National Wildlife Refuge that surrounds the Kennedy Space Center on the east coast of Florida. And this is perfect insect habitat. Um, and yet I can go all day, except for the early morning, or if you go into some of the hardwood hammocks where it's nice and shady, I can go all day and not get a single bug bite. Um, it used to be teeming with all kinds of things. Now it's just as beautiful, but the insects are gone, which is strange and upsetting once you realize it. So we started thinking about making our yard more pollinator friendly. Uh, we haven't joined any programs or put up any signs or anything, but you know, you, you think about these things. And, and um, my idea was, you know, we have these beautiful flower gardens, which are um, bee and butterfly and other insect friendly. And that's how it's going to be. Um, uh, but I'd explain it to um, uh, our friends and you can see that they've got this thing in their mind as they think that, uh, you know, dude, in, in two months, your house is going to look like the Adams family thing and as if you abandon it and all your neighbors are going to hate you. Um, but it wasn't like that at all. Um, as I'll explain, we did modest incremental things. And the truth is you could drive by our house in North Haven and there's nothing about it that you would notice that's different than any other uh, place, it, um, at least you know, from a conventional street view of the house. One of the things that's important before you embark on any sort of changes is to think about your yard as an environment. It has all the same characteristics as other kinds of environments around you. And that's really important because you don't wanna get your heart set on doing things that just don't work for your particular context, your particular ecosystem, the surrounding habitats of your yard, et cetera. We are in North Haven in South Central Connecticut. And so that, um, for example, means that we usually, uh, for most times of the year, have plenty of water, plenty of rainfall. Uh, unfortunately, with climate change, uh, late summer droughts are becoming more and more common uh, in, in our area. But in general, for example, we have plenty of water. But um, in our particular context, we're up on a ridge line, the western ridge line of the Central Valley of Connecticut. And um, uh, for example, I just love iron. I was looking for it when I'm out doing nature photography because it's a bug and butterfly magnet. And I've tried growing ironweed in our particular context, and it just doesn't work because ironweed is a wetland plant. It wants moist soil most of the time, and our particular yard is high and dry. So it's important to be realistic about what you can do in your context. Um, I love dragonflies. They're, I think I like them even better than butterflies. But um, we don't have any natural 
uh, wetlands of any significant size within at least a mile of us or more. And so while we get, um, uh, um, uh, I've probably seen at least a dozen different species in transit, uh, dragonflies are not something that we can really do in our yard or, or nurture. We're at the top of a ridge line, as I said, and um, the, uh, uh, um, we have a big conventional lawn out front. About the most I can say in defense of it is we're wary of um, making more changes that that might um, increase uh, our our maintenance load right now. And also we don't use. Um, you know, for 25 years or more, any sort of pesticides or fertilizers or anything that would um, kill insects or other wildlife or end up in Long Island Sound. Um, but we're still trying to chew on what to do with our big conventional lawn. Uh, this is up us. We're um, uh, fairly close to the edge of uh, Sleeping Giant State Park. These are uh, views I took from Google Earth where I've exaggerated the vertical scale just so you could see more easily what I'm talking about. This is us in the middle. We're in this on this ridge line, the western edge of the Central Valley. That um, This is uh, the sort of southeastern view looking across the Central Valley, Quinnipiac River and I-91 down below us, and that's North Haven uh, down here. And we're up here, high and dry. So that governs a lot of what we can do in our particular context. Um, and as I say, you, you really need to think about that when you start making changes, not so much in terms of, you can go to the garden center and buy um, any one of dozens of different native plants in a pot and put them in your flower garden. And that's pretty much the way we started with things. But um, you've got to think carefully about your particular advantages and disadvantages from almost really an ecological point of view in terms of what you can do in your yard. Uh, this is a drone view of our yard uh, that I took, uh, I think, last spring. You can see we have lots and lots of dandelions, um, and those are really, really important for early spring uh, bees and uh, things like that. Um, but otherwise, it's a fairly, you know, substantial but conventional yard. We've got uh, a big uh, sugar maple here and three silver maples of significant size. Those are the only trees, uh, sizable trees, at least in the lawn area. We've got um, a natural advantage here in the, this really thick tangled hedgerow along the back of our yard here. And that's really important for uh, various kinds of wildlife. Um, it's also sort of horrific in a lot of ways. It's full of invasives. It's por got, we've got porcelain berry and, and bittersweet and all the other usual um, terrible suspects, autumn olive and things. Occasionally I try to cut it back, but um, I've sort of gotten used to it in the, in the sense that I, I've stopped fretting about it because it's actually fairly good wildlife and small animal habitat. And so um, some things you just have to live with, especially if your time and your, and your resources are not um, unlimited. As I said before, um, it, this is almost as much about what you stop doing or what you don't do as what you do. And one of the things I did, I think six years ago now, is stopped mowing certain areas of the yard, not huge areas, uh, but um, uh, along the, uh, what's the south edge of our, our, of our yard here, intentionally let things start growing, um, marked off areas where I was not gonna mow. And then fairly quickly, um, they grew up into grassy areas, which um, I've also periodically over the years spiked with um, uh, uh, garden center, uh, um, wild native plants um, that, that I've put into the areas uh, just to help them along. Uh, because uh, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, you may or may not get natural recruitment into those areas, or you may, you may recruit things that you don't want, like uh, sumacs or you know um, bittersweet or other kinds of things. So these yellow areas are areas either that we specifically planted for pollinators or that uh, we um, 
uh, uh, just don't mow anymore. And uh, so this is an area like that. We have this, oh, I should back up and say, we have this natural low area, which we realized years ago and we had a reverse drainage problem on the south side of the house, made a perfect sort of bioswale. So we had folks come in and dig this all out and make a better drainage for us to solve the, the, the drainage problem up against the house. And it drains into this um, bioswale rain garden area. Um, which is a sort of natural hedgerow. But even in the heaviest rains, when we've got a lot of water draining through this area here and out, none of it reaches the street. It all gets absorbed by this natural sort of bioswale, which is now even more effective because this is one of the areas that I don't mow. And um, uh, we've never had any complaints from the neighbors or, or anyone else. Um, people are sort of interested if they go by and happen to notice them, what we're up to and why we do things. I keep the edges of these things very neatly trimmed. So it's, it's um, uh, very intentional looking. And, um, uh, but we've let areas that we used to tend uh, get get um, a lot wilder and weedier than they used to be. Not huge areas, but but significant enough so that we've gotten lots of um, uh, lots more diversity as well as numbers of insects. This is sort of close up. You can see most of this, for example, the golden rods um, uh, just appeared. Uh, um, I didn't never notice them when when I was mowing this area, but once I stopped mowing it, they sort of recruited themselves and moved into the areas. I had too many black eyed Susans in other areas of the yard, so I put those in myself. And some of these other things like the asters and there are this is probably gone by in in this area, but there's lots of coneflower in here too, and those things I just you know picked. Uh, um, suitable species from the garden center, and I sort of spiked them into these unmowed areas. And um, this looks a little bit weedy here, probably. I hadn't mowed um, in a bit, but I keep the edges nice and sharp. And a lot of this stuff has just moved in all by itself. I'd have to say I did not rototill these areas or do anything special. I literally just stopped mowing in these areas and, and sort of watched what happens over the last uh, five or six years. And so many of these plants have moved in themselves. Some of them I have um, brought in and sort of spiked in as, as potted plants that I, that I planted in here. And, um, over the years, uh, as we built up these things, I realized that although I didn't necessarily, I mean, I wanted more butterflies, I wanted more bees, I wanted other kinds of interesting insects, uh, because I spend a lot of time photographing them, for example, and drawing and um, uh, uh, other things with them for projects. I wasn't necessarily thinking in a holistic way, certainly at least at first, about how a more diverse environment would be good for other kinds of things in a more balanced uh, view. And um, I didn't set out to uh, grow foxes, but um, we have foxes, we have groundhogs, we have uh, lots and lots of cottontail rabbits, um, many field mice, uh, white-footed um, white deer mice, etc., cetera, um, that have come in, they just love these natural areas. They sort of disappear into them. And um, so, uh, as I said, I didn't set out to make a red tail or a, or a wild turkey habitat, but the more diverse your habitat becomes, uh, the, the, the less you mow and, and over garden things, um, the more wildlife you'll get. And there's all kinds of aspects that you can think of for how to take the natural advantages you may have and shape them in ways um, uh, to bring in more diversity. Now, you don't have to think about all of these things at first. It could be just, um, I'm gonna plant more wildflowers and enjoy the native wildflowers and, and um, uh, enjoy the, the 
butterflies and bees and other things that will come in. But gradually, as you get a little bit more sophisticated and a little bit more intentional about what you're doing, you can think of all of these kind of structural and species diversity sorts of things, which you can bring to bear to make your uh, yard not only have more wildlife and from a quantitative point of view, but maybe in some ways, just as importantly, um, more diversity. One of the big aspects, if you know anything about ecology and diversity, is species height diversity, not just species diversity in itself, that is how many different kinds of things live in a particular area, but um, there's a tight correlation between species diversity and species height diversity. And these are in this transitional area, or what ecologists call an ecotonal area. That is, they transition from one environment, whoops, um, uh, in this case, an open grassland to something more foresty. And especially if there is a transitional area, you're going to get um, more wildlife and more diverse wildlife if there is a, a distinct transition. What happens in a lot of suburban areas is you may be surrounded by forest, but if your yard goes right up to the edge of the forest, full stop, and then the forest trees start, you've missed an opportunity to increase the diversity of your habitat um, if you don't have some transitional plants in the way uh, there. Uh, because it will, the structural diversity uh, provides more habitat. And a lot of species um, uh, look for that. One of the things you can do is um, maintain brush piles. We have that big sort of weedy uh, hedgerow behind us at the back of our yard. And I've intentionally, as I do yard cleanup and clean up winter kill and uh, rake out uh, our flower beds eventually after things have had a chance to hatch and whatnot, all that goes back into our hedgerow in brush piles and the animals just love it. One of the things that I highly um, urge you to do, regardless of what you plant or what exactly your, your habitat is, is keep a yard journal because it is hard, even if you're paying a lot of attention from one year to the next to remember uh, um, what's going on in your yard and when to expect things. And that can be, if once you know that and have a record of it, that can be enormously useful for planning things like, Oh, you know, what do you want blooming in the fall as opposed to the summer or the early spring uh, to to make us to, to sort of shoulder off the main growing season so that things aren't starving in the spring uh, or or the fall as many of your flowers have uh, died back. I know my friend uh, Robin, um, I've, I've, for the past couple of years, I've sort of whined to her about, um, you know, gee, it's June, our yard is full of flowers, where are all the butterflies? Is this going to be a bad year for butterflies, yada, yada. Um, now that I have a journal, I know that we're not going to see in our particular yard big butterflies like the swallowtails or um, fritillaries or other kinds of things until at least mid-July. So um, our season for the big butterflies is from mid-July to at least mid-September and sometimes even further. Uh, I know that now. I didn't know that before. So you can get frustrated if you planted a lot of stuff and you're looking around wondering, you know, you've set up all this party. Uh, where, where are the guests? Um, well, the guests have their own schedule and it's good to pay attention to when things are common. As I said, for us, I don't see big swallowtails um, or, or monarchs in any significant number until at least mid-July. It's just the way it is. We see other things, um, skippers, um, early, earlier butterflies, etc. But, um, you know, I can want tiger swallowtails all I want in June, but they're not going to be there for another month. One thing that's really important um, that, that's fairly easy to do, especially in a yard like ours, which is very dry and has no wetlands near it, is provide water in the form of bird bass and other things. We've got probably three uh, um, sizable um, 
and uh, they draw birds um, often uh, at least as effectively as a big feeder. Uh, the birds just love it. And uh, around us, they have no other sources. So even in the wintertime, um, we have um, a heated uh, water bath. One thing that I'd urge you to do um, that a lot of bird baths don't have is um, I learned to put um, gravel flat like river stones and things into the bird baths so that smaller birds and even things like butterflies and bees will come in and sit on those stones and it gives them a little bit of a transitional area. So a big bird bath may drop off like a cliff into water and it makes it awkward for just about everything, but especially for the smaller animals. So think about when you have a bird bath, think about it in terms of a microhabitat all its own for a small thing like a butterfly or a bee or a chickadee. Um, is is it going to be friendly enough and um, uh, um, putting in river stones and things like that can make it so i wrote this talk uh, before i saw marjorie winter's talk um, uh, talking about pollinator gardens the last time around and it's interesting that we happen to fasten on the same sort of thing i love fritillaries love to see them in the yard we do see them this is a yard shot from uh, on our butterfly we um, and um, what I didn't know until I did some reading on ha habitats and, and life cycle is that although um, they love at, in the adult stage and the nectar stage, uh, many of the plants we've put out, what I didn't know is that um, uh, wood violets are a crucial uh, um, uh, egg laying and caterpillar stage for uh, great spangled fritillaries and, and um, some of the other fritillaries. And so you need to also think not just about seeing the big butterflies in, in mid to late summer, but think about where they come from. What kinds of things do they lay eggs on? What kinds of, of plants do they uh, uh, do the caterpillars use? And that's why people emphasize so much native plants as opposed to other kinds of things is butterfly weed will attract butterflies like crazy and that's great. But uh, butterfly weed is not native to this area. Nothing lays eggs on it and there are no caterpillars on it. So a big part of the life cycle that you want to encourage these, the, this kind of wildlife needs to be there. And luckily there are great resources for it now. Pollinator gardens have gotten very popular and I highly urge you to look at the Xerxes Society books because they're very authoritative and knowledgeable. They've been around for a long time. The Xerxes Society encourages um, uh, insect um, uh, uh, habitats, et cetera. And there's lots of great resources for this. So you can learn as you go. Um, uh, when you think about transitioning into a uh, uh, pollinator garden, you know, and they have this image that like, you know, two months later, your, your beautiful flower gardens are gonna look like a bad mescaline salad. And, and, um, and all you're gonna have is dandelions. And it's not like that at all. Not that I have anything against dandelions, but, um, there are lots and lots of beautiful native plants. So, you know, on the spectrum of things between completely wild and weedy and Versailles, if you're somewhere in the middle and you'd like some, some uh, conventional flower beds, it's, it's um, no great sacrifice. There are beautiful things like, in this case, butterfly weed and other kinds of flowers, blanket flowers, black-eyed Susans, uh, cone flowers, et cetera. Very easy to get. Uh, lots of things love them. Butterflies and bees love them. And they're beautiful too. So um, it's not hardship duty uh, to encourage these things. Um, uh, Black-eyed Susans, I, I warn you about, they spread like crazy. So um, I've, I've um, had to dig them out occasionally and plant them in other parts of the yard. But uh, the, the butterflies and bees love them. So um, it's when you think about doing these kinds of things, even if you don't want to just suddenly stop mowing your lawn or whatever um, and, and have more conventional sorts of, of flower beds, uh, there are things you can do even with conventional flower beds, which are aesthetically beautiful and very much better for 
uh, all kinds of wildlife. As, as I said, if you drove by our house and you know sort of glance our house is on the street. We have conventional flower beds and we put up hanging baskets and other kinds of things. But um, we always have an eye toward um, uh, things that are good for pollinators. Like I love coleus um, uh, as, a, as a plant. Uh, we've got, um, this just happens to show some coleus there. I would always, because I'm mostly interested in the foliage, nip off the flowers that grow. Coleus is a, is a kind of mint. Um, uh, I don't do that anymore because the bees love coleus flowers. So even though it's not native, even though we grow it because it's a garden flower sort of thing, uh, there are things you can do or just as importantly often not do that uh, that can make things uh, better for uh, the smaller kinds of wildlife like black swallowtails. And as I said, if, if um, we're not especially knowledgeable gardeners and Lord knows there are a zillion things we don't know about pollinator gardens, but if we've done anything that is a little bit different it's to pay a lot of attention to what happened after we started changing things. And it's absolutely fascinating. I've really gotten into um, macro photography of things. And when you look closely at some of the stuff that's going, you know, in this case, it's literally a few feet outside our back door. It's like an alien fascinating world um, uh, that, that is right out there. And um, we've really enjoyed um, the fact that, um, as I said, all, I didn't set out to make woodchuck gardens, but the woodchucks love them, uh, as do the cottontails and other kinds of things, um, field mice, um, which draw in the foxes. And, and, uh, and so it's made our, our uh, enjoyment uh, of, our, of our micro habitat, our little backyard national park, uh, much more enjoyable. Um, uh, years ago, I planted uh, probably about a half dozen butterfly bushes. I don't beat myself up about it. I wouldn't plant more of them because now I understand that they only uh, are useful to things like fritillaries at one part of their life cycle. And I'd prefer to plant other things instead now. But um, it's, it's all part of the mix of things. And when you start looking more closely, I've always been fascinated by, for example, uh, uh, clearwing moths, which is a kind of moth which, which imitates uh, bumblebees. In fact, um, you'd have to look carefully to notice the difference um, between bumblebees and clearwing moths. They visit the flowers the same way. They're even they even look like bumblebees. Um, it's the kind of thing that I was sort of vaguely aware that they were around, but never paid much attention to before. But having done all this stuff, um, changed the yard, I've tried to pay a lot more attention to what's happening and, and started keeping, for example, species lists. So um, to give myself some sense of what the diversity was, I don't have lists from before we started doing this. I'm not doing a research project, but um, uh, I'm amazed at the diversity uh, of stuff that's going on in our yard now. And it's a great in inspiration for me as, a, as an artist and illustrator to have all this wildlife literally right outside my door. I have this circuit that I do in uh, particularly in high summer, you know, um, July, August, September, uh, where I'll keep a camera handy literally near the door. And I'll just do um, a circuit at least every morning and e every evening, looking at what's going on and who's around. And sometimes it's amazing. You get up in the morning and um, uh, my wife, was making breakfast then she looked out the window and saw this on our pool fence uh we have turkeys um i'm not growing turkey habitat necessarily or we didn't intend that but we got them anyway um they particularly like all the bird seed that the birds kick out of our feeders and and it ends up on the ground so so the hens are attracted to that and they'll come in this on this particular morning three different hens with large surviving broods ended up in our yard sitting on the pool fence. I'm not quite sure why, maybe there was a fox nearby or something, but at any rate, um, it's just amazing. 
what um, uh, what we've seen, all the different diversity that we didn't know we had. Um, we have bumblebees. I love bumblebees. I know um, these days people are sort of down on them because they're they're not native, et cetera, but they're incredible in all kinds of dimensions and they're fascinating to watch. Uh, but we don't just have bumblebees. I, I um, you know, 10 years ago, if you said you have 25 species of bees in your yard, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I didn't know that. But now that I'm actually paying attention um, and, and we've produced a, a much more diverse and interesting landscape for them, we've got lots of different kinds of bees. And as I said, once you pay attention to, to this stuff, it's, um, it's hard to imagine alien worlds that would be more strange and surprising than this. I show people my bee photographs, you know, very, very close up photographs, and they ask me how, how often I've gotten stung. And I have to say, I have never, ever been stung by a bee. Um, the, the usual advice is true. If you move slow and careful and you're not threatening them and you don't swat them or do anything crazy, uh, they just ignore you. Um, so um, if you're worried about that aspect of, of um, bees, I can assure you that I've gotten within inches of um, many hundreds of bees over the years and never been bothered by them. Uh, before I retired from Yale, I did a, um, Yale has a, a um, beekeeping program um, that they do for students in, in one of the Yale farms. And I did a whole video on them where at first I was extremely wary and, but decided for various reasons uh, not to wear a bee suit. And I couldn't really use the camera wearing head coverings. And I ended up um, standing right next to the hive uh, um, uh, uh, with the, the bees all around me and never got stung. Um, but if you look carefully, uh, it's just amazing. I would, I didn't know we had European wool carter bees um, in our yard or uh, pugnacious leaf cutter bees. They're cute little bees. Um, I don't know why they're called, I think they're called pugnacious because the, the female has large jaws on them, but they're no more pugnacious than any other little bee. And they're very cute. And I had no idea that they were there. Um, my wife hates bull thistles. I love them. And um, I love them particularly because so many other things love them. Uh, butterflies and bees just love them. You don't want to step on one or back into one. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful with them. And they do spread like crazy. So uh, we haven't let them overrun the yard. But uh, as I said, butterflies and bees just love them. So thinking differently about plants that you might have just cut out or mowed over before are, uh, is, is part of the package of things. And if you think differently about them um, and, and begin to appreciate them, you know, as I said, it, it looking carefully at what's going on in the yard has been a huge part of the fun and pleasure of getting into this stuff. It's almost hardly worth it to, to do all this stuff and then not pay attention to the glorious things that happen once you do. Um, and uh, the goldfinches just love, love bull thistles. So that's been part of the fun. We always had goldfinches, but it's just wonderful to watch um, all their antics and nest building and all that other stuff that, that, that you get to see right in the yard. Um, uh, I have found it incredibly inspiring, not just as a photographer to have all this stuff going on, but one day I started thinking as I was um, photographing some skippers, what would the world look like from a skipper's point of view? I was thinking about maybe a kid's book or something like that, but, um, but it just started, you know, just as a fun exercise, what does the world look like from a skipper's point of view? and um, started putting my cameras down into areas literally where skippers had just been and looking around at stuff just as a fun exercise. What does this world look like? And it, and it becomes, you know, uh, um, uh, just a whole different way of looking at the world. 
um, a conventional bed of black-eyed Susans becomes this strange jungle world of, of um, uh, different kinds of habitats just as a fun exercise. So um, I'm sure the neighbors wonder why I was laying around on the lawn with a camera looking up at the sky, but I don't really care. I was having a great time. And uh, um, all of this is going on right outside the door. All you have to do is uh, small incremental changes, many of which involve not doing things like mowing certain areas that you used to do. And um, if I leave you with one particular thought is, for God's sakes, go out and look at all the glorious stuff that's going on in your yard. Make notes about it. Uh, keep, keep species lists if you're a birder. Um, keep a yard list of things. Um, so thank you very much. That's my talk. Thanks, Pat. Dennis? And uh, we have a number of questions, uh, including one that I got before the program even started. Uh, Rob, you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask your questions? Yeah, sure. Hey, everyone. This is Rob Rock from New Haven. Pat, maybe we cross paths at Yale at some point in time in the past. Um, Thanks for the presentation. My question is relevant to this time of year, which is I let everything go all winter long. I, I leave everything, all my native stuff. And now this time of year, a lot of it's looking very messy. Is our current best practice to continue not doing anything at all? Or are we okay with doing a little curatorial work? <laughs> I, I Personally, I've looked at our really, really ratty um, areas and, you know, you almost um, uh, itch to grab a rake and, and, and uh, or maybe straighten up stuff or whatnot, but I'm resisting because um, the advice is that um, all those butterfly and other pupae and, and things that are down um, below the leaves, which I left in the gardens um, all winter, um, need to germinate. Um, the eggs need to hatch, the, the caterpillars need to, um, uh, to get working. And so um, I've, I've read, there's a particular temperature, I think maybe it was 50, uh, consistently above 50 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. I'm going to wait until um, either I just can't stand it or May 1st, you know, whichever comes uh, to start straightening up stuff uh, because that of that issue that a lot of the stuff that you want to encourage the butterfly pupa and eggs and things like that are down in that litter. Um, and, and so I've resisted over the past few years cleaning them up. I can't say that there's been, you know, a big quantitative change, like, you know, I stopped raking and now I have twice the number of butterflies or something, but I'm, I'm just working with the same advice that, you know, all the rest of us have heard, which is don't rake out all that stuff. And, and I'm also careful now to treat the stuff that I do rake out as uh, biologically relevant. That is, I will put it back in our hedgerow area. So I'm hoping that if I have inadvertently raked out stuff, that um, by uh, treating it, you know, relatively gently and wheelbarrowing it all out into the uh, into the hedgerow and and putting it there, that um, whatever it is that I may have inadvertently removed will still survive, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, uh, that was my follow up question. So, so you kind of saw that coming. Thanks. Because you, when you do do a little bit of that curatorial work, I've wondered, you know, what I should do with it. Should I put it in a small brush pile? Should I leave it in place and just cut it and just drop it to the ground? Or should I put it in a compost bin? Yeah, I, I would leave things certainly for now and maybe for the next month um, in place. If, as I say, if you can stand it, um, does look a bit ratty, but um, it, it's great for whatever it is that's growing in these habitats that you've created. And uh, as I said, even when I rake the stuff out, I treat it like biologically active and valuable stuff, which is I try not to um, 
uh, abuse it physically too much and just move the stuff over and and put it in our hedgerow brush piles and as i said i'm i'm hoping that that will uh make it easier for anything that i have inadvertently removed to to survive in any way the uh, usual rule of thumb is a week of 50 degrees yeah yeah um, i think i've i've read that um uh so it makes sense to me i mean stuff needs to get growing kim you want to uh, ask your question Hi. Uh, yeah, I had two questions. One was, when was the best time to plant milkweed seeds? I got some at a botanical garden up in Maine, and I was wondering when was the best time to do that. Um, and my other question was about your uh, macro photography equipment, um, as that was really kind of cool pictures you had. Oh, thank you. Um, the first advice I'd have is don't bother with seeds at all. Um, go to Dennis's um, uh, um, um, garden and buy some milkweeds <laughs> because that's that's the way to do it. Uh, uh, Monongatuck um, sells common and swamp uh, milkweed and maybe butterfly butterfly weed you can get in almost any garden center too. And that's the way I would do it. No, yeah, that... Milkweed is notoriously hard to grow from seed. Uh, and and um, so, you know, um, that's on milkweed. I have Canon SLR cameras with a variety of macro lenses. And uh, um, uh, I, did, I didn't make any notes about um, uh, uh, what's what in, in terms of my current macro lenses. But the main thing I've been doing lately that's a little bit different is uh, uh, using either a ring light or I have another um, ring light type setup that has two twin flashes on it, um, which uh, um, give, uh, ring lights are, are great for lots of things. The, the wrap on ring lights is that they tend to flatten things out a bit um, in, in terms of the softness of the light, et cetera. So you may not always like the effect that ring lights give. And these are not big ring lights like they use for fashion photography. These are um, ring light flashes that go right on the end of your macro lens. And um, you know the, the ones I use uh, come from Amazon. I'm blanking on the name. It's some Chinese uh, brand that um, uh, they cost, I don't know, about 200 bucks um, for the twin light setup. I think maybe a little bit less for the conventional ring light. And ring lights are great uh, because although the light can be a bit bright and harsh, depending on how close you are to the subject, you get tremendous depth of field. Um, uh, a lot of the shots of bees, for example, uh, were taken in between F11 and F16. So you get lots of depth of field, um, which is great because um, when you're working with fractions of a millimeter of critical focus, you want as much depth of field as you can get. So that's what I do. I'm, I'm my uh, blanking on the um, particular brand. I think my favorite one at the moment is a Sigma. Uh, it's roughly, uh, 100 and the equivalent of about 150 um, millimeter uh, lens um, and uh, uh, so that in a nutshell is my macro setup no, sorry I didn't I should have thought to make notes <laughs> no worries thanks so much you're welcome the other Kim oh you mean me Yes. <laughs> now, I, I, um, I don't know if I had a question. I was just thinking about, though, um, I was really, really, really glad to get reminded of the, um, of the cleanup delay because um, sometimes it's, you know, lately it's been pretty warm. And, you know, even though I have been seeing pictures of, you know, cocoons and pupae and overwintering things, it's, it's sort of hard to believe sometimes that you know, things are still living in there and um, we, we shouldn't be moving them. So I really appreciate that. Um, I heard someone talk recently about hollow stemmed um, 
uh, plants versus not hollow stemmed. And I, I thought that was really interesting. Do you have any insights into like, is that is that a distinction that we could be paying attention to and that would benefit us? Uh, well, um, you know, I, uh, I'm not super knowledgeable about it, but I've probably read the same things you have, which is that some hollow stemmed uh, uh, plants um, uh, contain uh, overwintering eggs or pupa or whatnot. So that's why I said that to um, uh, uh, even when you get to the point where it's warm enough that you start uh, raking out your beds and cutting down, say, the, the old dry stems from last year, um, uh, realize that um, it's good to wait because even the stems may contain things, um, eggs either on or within the stems. And uh, when you do finally rake out stuff, um, treat it a bit gently, treat it as, as a potential incubation area because that very often is what it is. And as I said, I'll put the stuff in the wheelbarrow and bring it out to um, parts of our hedgerow sort of brush pile area and put the stuff there. Um, again, with the hope that if I have inadvertently moved something that it will still survive uh, uh, the, the process of having cleaned up the beds. But I can, I can understand, you know, um, we've had um, some days that are cl been close to 70 degrees and it just makes you itchy to get out and garden and do things. And it seems like the, the aesthetic um, these days is, um, is to resist the urge to do things, uh, um, to rake out the beds and do the sort of conventional flower bed cleanup that you might be thinking about at this time of year. Thank you so much. The Thank other you thing you need to be talk. concerned about is the soil um, at, uh, the, at that time of year. It, in what way? Compacting it because it's, uh, it's still got the, the winter moisture in it. Mm. You added, yeah, I'm um, compacting it. And also a lot of the, the uh, diverse um, uh, bee species that we get, Mm, a large percentage of them are ground nesters. So you don't want to be squishing the soil too much. You had another question, Kim, about uh, butterfly weed and butterfly bush. Oh, yeah. I, um, 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 Patrick, you said um, that butterfly weed, nobody lays eggs on it. But you meant butterfly bush, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, um, butterfly bush. Um, uh, uh, the decorative stuff with the big purple flowers and things. I was not talking about the native uh, um, orange milkweed, yeah. uh, which um, uh, uh, is um, not only really uh, a handsome garden plant, uh, but it's a native milkweed. So, so it has the, all the advantages of a native plant. Right. Thank you. Carrie, you have your hand up. Uh, thank you. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, thank you. So I try to plant native, but I have to admit that I've been cheating with tropical milkweed. And, um, and the reason is, you know, we raise um, monarchs as best we can every summer. And when I plant, you know, regular milkweed, Joe pie weed, butterfly weed, I don't get many eggs. But as as soon as I put in the tropical milkweed, I cannot collect the eggs fast enough. And of course I leave some out there. Um, and also aphids then come on the eggs and then some other um, uh, insects then go and eat the aphids. So why not with the butterfly crisis, the monarch crisis that's occurring, why not just cheat there with the tropical milkweed? Thank yeah, you for I'm, taking my question. Uh, I don't know much about this particular subject. I haven't had any experience with tropical milkweeds, but I'm sort of notorious among my um, uh, wildlife birder friends uh, for my indifference to the whole issue of, of um, alien versus native species is um, uh, so, you know, as I said, I years ago planted um, butterfly bush, Bedelia, um, uh, Budlia, um, uh, and I'm not going to go chop them out because the butterflies like them and, you know, etc. But um, uh, 
Uh, I guess I would do more research before I, I got too far into it. I, uh, um, it, it's just not something that I, I personally am knowledgeable about at all. Thank you so much. Let's see, any other questions? There's a, there was a comment, uh, Sophia uh, made a comment about milkweed seeds. You wanna expand upon that? Sophia? Um, yes, so we are actually doing the, um, uh, uh, Masaro Farm has sponsored a, um, a six week gardening class and it's being held by the lady, I can't remember her name, Rachel, who works at the Connecticut Agricultural Station. And it's really, really an awesome class. And we've been talking about various things, whether you should germinate it yourself or just buy the plant. And I have to agree that uh, milkweed seeds require what's called cold stratification. So either need to spread them or plant them in the fall because without the cold, the seeds will never germinate. You can try germinating them in the refrigerator. You take like a wet paper towel and you put them between the wet paper towel and you put them in your refrigerator for four to six weeks, but it is no guarantee. So I have to agree that buying from your lovely garden center is probably a much better idea for the milkweed. Yeah, I a um, couple of years ago, I decided um, that uh, I would go out to a few um, sort of wild, uh, but but sort of ratty and untended fields that we have in the neighborhood, and collected up um, uh, golden rods and milkweed seeds and ironweed and all kinds of other stuff. Um, anything that I could find that was in seed, this was probably in September, or early October, and literally brought back buckets of the stuff and put it on our uh, our pollinator areas, which are admittedly or you know covered with grass, so wasn't the ideal habitat. And um, I did get um, more diversity of goldenrods, but it was um, in terms of for milkweed, uh, it was a complete waste of time. I didn't get a single common milkweed. So I, I would say um, go to Mononkatuck's uh, um, uh, natural uh, plant sales and buy your milkweed. Thank you. Um, one thing about common milkweed is even um, it may take several years for the seeds to germinate and uh, you get plants. I, in my yard, I got some um, milkweed pods from a friend and I just tossed them in the garden and nothing happened and nothing happened and nothing happened and now I've got this giant patch of common milkweed. It took several <laughs> years for it to get going. That's what I was afraid of is I would, you know, it'd be like Mickey and the broom. Um, I, you know, I'd be out there fretting because for now for the second year, I haven't seen any milkweeds. And then, you know, maybe next year I'd walk out one day and the milkweeds would have taken over my whole yard. But I don't, I don't, think we're in danger of that. I th I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be a customer of yours soon to buy some more milkweeds. Although the damn woodchucks um, ate the, the ones I planted last year. I don't, you know, I know that's not supposed to happen, or I thought it was not supposed to happen, but um, the woodchucks love them. That's a new one for me. <laughs> yeah, me too. A little frustrating. Does anyone else have a question? Uh, yes, um, I have a question. Bob. Uh, yeah, I, I, where I live, my soil is very clay based and I don't have a very large yard. So when I want to put in some native plants, would you recommend that I dig out the area of the soil and replace it with? nice uh, new topsoil, peat moss, newer, that sort of thing? Or could I just dig a hole? Because sometimes when I will put a rhododendron in, say I have to dig a huge hole and fill it with new topsoil. Otherwise the plant will just die if I refill in the old clay. 
Yeah, I, I can relate. Um, when I plant uh, garden center plants into these unmowed sort of pollinator patches, we call them, uh, it is, it's, it's like chiseling brick or something. Um, we have the same kind of problem with the soil. So uh, I have to say, um, I haven't done um, uh, any real soil amendments or anything out um, uh, aside from you know, opening up a, a reasonably sized hole and, and maybe putting in some time release uh, fertilizer and stuff at the bottom and then replacing the plant. And, and that's about all I've done. In our conventional flower beds, I have definitely rototilled and um, uh, we do a compost heap. So we have plenty of compost and, and I tilled in all that stuff and planted the plants and, and then you know, let it, let it grow. And um, those plants do really well because they've got great soil uh, that's very deep and it's not the hard red, you know, brick-like stuff that we've got under most of our lawn. Uh, um, so I wouldn't discourage you from doing it, but um, uh, for um, uh, uh, um, the, our unmowed areas, I briefly thought about rototilling them and decided that that was just beyond the time um, uh, that, that I had to invest in that. So I just stopped mowing them and it's worked out just fine. Uh, in, in most cases, but uh, I'm sure that if I had bothered to rototill them and amend the soil, uh, that um, things would be growing more luxuriantly than they are. Uh, Very good, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Seeing no one asking, I will uh, thank Pat again for uh, oh, thanks thanks very much for having me